Well, hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to Stratosphere Lounge. I see levels here, which is always a good sign. Um, today, for the first time, I think, in, in TSL history, I was not able to hear the playback, uh, but I was able to expertly fade uh, Petula Clark out due to watching the levels up there, which is something that we industry professionals pick up over time. How's everybody doing? Um, okay, good. I'm hoping that's good. So guess what? The Stratosphere Lounge um, mugs are out the door. It came in a couple days ago. We started addressing them that day. Uh, some of you may have already seen them, but in any event, um, they are on their way out, and they are absolutely gorgeous. Those of you who've, um, who've bought them, thank you. Uh, it's very, very uh, kind. It's great to have everybody kind of on the same team like that with the same uh, uniform mugs, so we don't have anybody feeling left out. And if you aren't one of those people who... Um, who bought a um, Stratosphere Lounge mug at uh, BillWhittle.com. Um, we'll be happy to give them out for free to uh, to all of you who didn't buy them because we don't want your self-esteem to suffer. Offer not good in continental 40 states. Or Alaska or Hawaii. Hi. So, um, it is uh, Women's Day, which I didn't even know about. Apparently it's International Women's Day. I mentioned this on the live show earlier today. And the reason I did find out about it is in Russia... Um, which I have a connection to now. Um, in Russia, it's a big deal. Everybody gets flowers and um, and uh, babushkas, uh, the little kids, everybody. It's quite a big deal, so um, not going to be too late tonight on account of I have to take my girlie out to um, out to uh, women's night dinner, a women's day dinner. It's a big deal over there with these Russians, these savages, barbarians. In any event, uh, it's good to be here. So... Um, you know, not much to report. Uh, next week I'm going to be gone. I'm going to be Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday in Dallas. I know a bunch of you have sent me emails or, or, or sent Carly emails. In any event, um, I uh, do. I I am going to have time there. I got to coordinate it with Scott. Maybe we can do. Um, maybe we can do a uh, you know like a mini Stratacon kind of thing. Like when I say mini, I mean mini. However, many of you are in the in the Texas area. Uh, I'm going to get in there Sunday night late. I'm going to be there Monday night, Tuesday night, and I think I fly out Wednesday night for an event in Florida on Friday. So it doesn't look like there's going to be Stratosphere Lounge next week. However, um, we can definitely figure out a place to go um, in Dallas. If anybody has um, any good ideas about where to go in Dallas, where we might be able to find a couple of big tables and, you know... Um, uh, hang out and have a, a beer or two. That would be absolutely fun. I, I, I'm hoping we can get Scott there. I'd be surprised if we couldn't. But in any event, um, it would be terrific to do that. So yes, for those of you who've been asking, I'm going to be I'm I'm going to be available. I've got nothing to do uh, except write firewalls and do NRA TV shows. So um, for those that you don't know, I'm going to be doing um, Grant Stinchfield show. I hosted um, guest hosted Colian Noir show last week. It was fun. And this time I'm going to be um, uh, hosting a grant show. So I'll have to call in and interview myself. Now, for those of you who are playing um, uh, Stratosphere Lounge Bingo, uh, when I say, you know, I'm not going to be here too late, that does in fact count for this is going to be short, quick. It's going to be a short show. I'm going to get to this pretty quick. Um, so um, stamp your cards accordingly. Uh, and um, I just... Uh, I just love, love, love that Petula Clark. All right, we'll see. Well, we got some great questions, and, and as I say, don't want to spend too much time here tonight because the uh, door's going to open sometime soon, and we got to go out and have ourselves a nice dinner. And, and by the way, I went out to this um, um, Russian restaurant in here in Los Angeles, and um, I don't know what it is they served, but I'm I'm pretty sure it's not food. Um, it's, you know, we we've gone to some. She's always saying how how tasty everything is here, and uh, I um, you, you know, if I take uh, Natasha out to a really nice restaurant uh, like Masters in Beverly Hills, it's about the nicest place I know of. Um, we'll get like a, a a lovely steak, and we'll get some, you know, maybe some. Um, like a really good steak, and some um, shoestring um, French fried potatoes, real thin, and some cream corn, and some um, sweet potato um, squash. And you can look at those, and you can say, that's a piece of steak. Those are French fried potatoes. 
that is creamed corn, and over here is the um, is the sweet potato uh, hash or whatever they call it. But Russian food is not like that. Um, Russian food comes to you, and it keeps coming. Now, this was a Russian Armenian restaurant. This may be more Armenian than Russian, but um, I have to tell you, we were there just last Friday, and and it was a, like a tenth anniversary for this restaurant, and it is just. It's unbelievable. I mean, you walk into this place, and and sitting in front of you is so just the two of us on a table, and we're sitting on the same side of the table, which is very nice. But we got to be sitting on the same side of the table because we've got to, um, you know, it's almost like you're two people conning a ship or something, or or a pilot and a co-pilot. Somebody's got to help keep track of uh, what's coming. There are like seven or eight different um, plates on the on the um, table. They're kind of long uh, oval plates. And then on top of the table is this arch. It's like a silver arch, probably made out of steel. And it's got a shelf here, and I think another shelf maybe, and then a flat shelf on top. Because they're literally now stacking um, the food two or three or four deep. And it just keeps coming and coming and coming and coming and coming. Um, and it tastes different than, than the food from here. And that's all I'm going to say. All I'm going to say. Um, it's, uh, it's, it, it tastes a little different. Um, most of it, you don't have any idea what it is. Uh, w one thing that came out that looked like a really good chicken katsu turned out to be sliced eel. And I don't like seafood of any kind. And I'm a pretty, I'd have to say, some people would say picky eater. I think squeamish is probably a better word. I got, you know, I'm kind of a steak and potato guy. I've sent more chickens to Hades than any man I've ever met. But in any event, that's pretty much it. And I like to know what it is. And um, all on this, you get this um, bread with this, um, you know, scoops of pate or caviar and everything, and, and everything's just like, you got to decode it. Uh, there was like a tomato, there, the, uh, like a, you know, it's just kind of a salad tomato. And I love tomatoes, and I, you know, a little one about that big. And I cut it in half, and I put the half in my mouth, and then I started chewing, and it was a pickled tomato. And... I was able to get half of it down, but this finally, I've, I, Natasha's laughing her head off, and I'm just chewing this thing like a, you know, like, like some kind of leather. And after, I don't know, maybe 60 seconds or so, I decided to abandon that effort. And in any event, we're going out there, and and makes her happy, and makes me unbelievably happy uh, to to see her um, speaking uh, Russian. Uh, in fact, last time we were there. It was the first time ever. There will be many more of these to come, especially in the summer we, when I go visit Russia. But it was the first time ever where um, somebody came up to me, came up to the table, rather, a, a waiter, and asked a question. And, and I just looked at them like, uh, like you, you have to ask my, uh, my fiancé here. Um, and I just... Uh, I just love it. It's fun. Uh, it, and they're big, big-hearted people and big celebrations, and everybody's toasting. There's a Russian um, tradition that I picked up, uh, and it's um, some I forget the wording, but it's nobody eats before everybody drinks, which means everybody has to have a drink uh, first. So shot of vodka. I drank about, well, together, the two of us probably drank two-thirds of a bottle of of uh, Stoli, which is an unbelievable amount of alcohol for me. I mean, I'm I two margaritas, and I'm just floating away to Margaritaville. But, um, yeah, it was fun. Anyway, so it was a great time. We'll be going out and doing that later, and the less I talk about it, the faster we'll be able to get out there. So we got um, just got one sheet today, five questions, but they're all real good. So um, the first one is really uh, moving, and there was something I wanted to prepare for that. So I'm going to have to do that um, Right now, I didn't get it there, but I'm going to get it there. Uh, if I can find it in the video section of my um, Apple uh, picture. Say, hey, okay, that looks good. Um, let's see. I'm going to take uh, you. And hang in there. It'll be worth the effort. Believe me. Trust me on this. Yeah, you are going to go right there, I think. Uh, no, you're not. Um, it's a heartbreaking question for me, and uh, you're you're about to understand why. Um, it comes from our friend Steve Darrow, and it, it reads this: um, A friend of mine is the command is the cadet commanding officer 
of Air Force ROTC Detachment 805 at Texas A&M University. She was just informed that she will be dismissed from the pilot training program due to failing the flight physical. Since you had to face that cold reality yourself, do you have any words of wisdom for my young friend? I do. Uh, actually, I've got quite a few words of wisdom for your young friend, not just words of wisdom. I've, I, think, I think I've got pictures of wisdom, uh, if I can just find out where they got uh, transferred to. And I will make this happen one way or another, so um, give me one second here and make sure I got this thing going. Come on, I, d I demand that you magically appear on my desktop. Uh, which I don't see happening might be hidden over here. Hang on a second, guys. It's worth the effort, believe me. I know. When, I know these. Um, you know these dead air segments are, are hilarious, uh, but um, this one's going to be worth the effort. One second, because this is the kind of question that I just kind of live for. Uh, hide you. Go away. All right. Where where is it? I put it on the desktop so that I could see it, and now I don't see it anywhere. <sighs> Hang on, hang on now, hang on. Last check, last check. I'm just, I, I really wanted to have this ready before the show, but I just couldn't. I just didn't have it ready at all because I was very busy. Wait, where are you? Oh, there, is that, is that you? No. Um, why isn't this? Why? why? I'm awful sorry, folks. Uh, I'm 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 preparing to answer this question um, in a way that um, makes real sense because it's the kind of question that really deserves an answer. And uh, for the life of me, I do not know why uh, this movie that I keep trying to copy and bring into the show is not coming in. Um, and if it oh there it is. Hang on now. Hold on. There it is. Okay. Sorry about that. So let's just put you right there. And this is the kind of question I actually, you know, stay up nights waiting to uh, to answer. Um, so, uh, and is there another one? I wanna... No, I think at this point I've wasted enough of you good people's time. All right, so here we go. Is um, Steve Darrow's friend, uh, young person, young woman, uh, failed the flight physical for the Air Force Academy, and and he wants to know if there's any. I'm sorry for um, didn't say the Air Force Academy flight uh, pilot training program. Um, and, and she's heartbroken, and um, who, so am I. Uh, I'm not only just heartbroken for me, I'm heartbroken for you. I know, I know how, how awful that feeling is. Um, it's awful to lose a, a dream that you've been working for for a long time. I suppose that's true for just about any um, occupation or anything, but I have a, I have a strange sensation, I can't put my finger on it, that it's different for um, for pilots, for people that want to be pilots. Uh, I think um, I think there's something about it. it I, I'm going to assume um, if, if she's, as, I wish I had her name, if she's as, as crushed as I was, that she's the kind of person that could never, you know, could never have an airplane um, go overhead or, or you just have to look. You have to look. Is there a plane overhead? What is it? Yeah. Something landing? Yeah, I'm going to watch this. So there is something I can do about this, and, and hopefully this will help. Um, if, if it turned out that you were interested in flying, um, you know, any kind of a, of a big airplane, multi-engine airplane, uh, you know, if you're, if you're interested in C-130s or, or C-17s, if you're interested in, um, you know, eventually multi-engine bombers, you want to fly an airplane with eight engines, you can do that in the Air Force. Uh, but... Um, if if it turns out that's what your what your goal was to become a professional pilot and fly commercially, this one I can deal with quite easily. Um, y you will find that uh, that there are any number of ways to do this. In, and what most people don't realize is one of the one of the um, one of the simplest ways to become a commercial pilot is to become a flight instructor. Uh, most flight instruction these days is given by brand new brand new commercial pilots, um, <laughs> which uh, is a, a little bit uh, interesting and alarming, but nevertheless, that's the case. Um, almost all of it is. So um, you can, oh, for the love of God, um, you can, in fact, get a, a, a pilot's license commercially by working hard, and it's not cheap, but it's not, out of, it's not completely out of range either. But I'm just going to go ahead and assume that you're heartbroken because you wanted to fly fighter planes is something something that you can't get a hold of. Uh, if you, if it was any of the big boys, you know the heavy heavy iron, you absolutely can get there. As a matter of fact, you could make a fairly compelling case that you could get there faster, um, 
in the civilian route than you might be able to through the military route because uh, they're looking for new pilots and they're looking for young pilots and the number of um, of uh, flying seats is getting bigger, not smaller. A uh, large number of former military people are retiring out and um, what we're seeing, especially in the market now, is this the rise of the commercial, of the, um, you know, the short duration commuter flights. And that used to be, you know, you're going to fly some turboprop, uh, you know, Gulfstream or something, you know, not Gulfstream, but you're going to fly some some turboprop, some Embraer or something. Now, the Embraer is making these, they look like two-thirds scale 737s, and they're fantastic, beautiful airplanes, really incredible. Um, and so you can fly those, and you can move on to a career in flying. You can do all of that in the civilian world without having to go through the Air Force. So, Let's just take that as the case. Now I'm going to move on to what I suspect is the actual um, problem, and that is that you wanted to fly something uh, a little sportier than than one of those, um, you know, C-17s or something. You like the feel, um, and you like the look of a fighter aircraft, and and there's uh, a lot I can do to um, sympathize with that. Uh, so, what do we do about that? Well. The first thing we do is is this. I'm just going to give you this as an example just to get you an idea of where we're going with this. If you wanted to be a, a, a professional basketball player and you wanted to play in the NBA and, and you were tall but maybe not quite as tall as you needed to be or for whatever reason you just didn't make it, you, you have to ask yourself, what is it about um, playing in the NBA that you really liked? Was it the, was it the, um, the adoration and was it the money? Uh, was it the lights or was it playing basketball? Which, what was it? Because if it turns out you were rejected for the NBA, but your love is playing basketball, then you can play basketball and you can play competitive basketball at a very high level um, out in the world. You can just, there are some, there are some amateur leagues, you know, there's this kind of thing, certainly in baseball, there are these minor league teams. If you wanted to, that's a better example. Let's say you wanted to be a, be, a baseball player and, and you just didn't make it, didn't make it in the pros. There are so many different um, leagues that are available, so many small town teams and so on. So if you wanted to play baseball because you like playing baseball, you're going to be okay. Um, if you want to play baseball because you want to be under the lights and um, have, um, you know, thousands and mi of millions of um, adoring fans, then you're going to have to, that's a little tougher. Um, you're going to have to figure out a way to play baseball and do something that gets you that because if you can't put them together. But I'm going to assume you don't want to play baseball. So I'm going to assume that means that you want to fly uh, high-performance aircraft that um, are not the kind of uh, puddle jumpers we were in. So I got, um, I got uh, rejected for the Air Force Academy, and after two months when I calmed down a little bit, um, I decided, all right, I'm just going to go get a... Um, I'm going to go get some flight training. So I, I booked uh, an hour in a Cessna 172. And that was not what I had in mind at all. It was, um, it was you know, slow and you sat in a chair and you had a door and you, had a, you didn't have a stick at a steering wheel and the throttle was this knob over here and, you know, and it smelled kind of like puke and it was not what I thought. And you, you have this propeller out there. I don't know. So... What do you do? Well, I can tell you what I did, um, and it took me a while. I realized that what I wanted to do was fly, and I wanted to fly high-performance aircraft, and I, and I liked the feel, and I liked the look of it, and I liked, especially liked the, um, the kind of people that you meet doing that. I liked the ethics of it. I liked uh, all the professionalism, all of that. So um, I decided to get as close to that in civilian world as I possibly can. Now, the first thing I did was take up um, gliding, soaring. If you look at a sailplane, uh, even the instructional sailplanes, I, I, I went out there finally after having done one or two lessons in a Cessna. I just said, this isn't what I had in mind. I just gave up on it. And then almost by accident, um, I, I bought a, a ride for two people, uh, and, um, and my friend from Chicago didn't want to go. So I uh, asked her if I guess I'm going to have to take the you know, the, um, the high performance flight. And they put me in the front seat of a Grobe 102, uh, Grobe 103. And, um, and just walking out to the glider, it looked like a fighter plane. You know, the beautiful canopy curve, you got that nice line on the nose. Um, and uh, the main thing is you got no propeller. 
you don't have to look at a propeller because it doesn't have one. Um, and I got in this thing and they opened the canopy. So instead of me getting into an airplane like you do on, on most virtually all general aviation airplanes where you kind of climb up on the wing and you open the door and you slide in and sit down, this, this guy just reached over and, and opened the canopy. And I look inside this aircraft and I see uh, very narrow, uh, it's tandem, per, so it's not wide. That's another reason why it doesn't feel like a, uh, a fighter is because, um, you know, you just, fighter jets, you don't sit side by side unless you're a Sukhoi 35 or something like that. Um, so uh, I sat in this thing and I got into the seat and I, and I realized, I'm, okay, I'm reclining at, a, at an angle here and instead of a, of a you know, typical... Um, commercial seat belt with a shoulder strap. I've got a five-point harness here, and, and I'm looking around, and, and I say, okay, there's a stick right here, and it's not a steering wheel. It's an actual stick. And over here where the throttle should be on my left, there are uh, dive brakes, uh, speed brakes, which um, allow you to uh, increase your dive angle and so on. And we took off, and we got up to four or 5,000 feet above the ground, and then um, the guy said, do you want to make this as fun as possible or do you want to make it as long as possible and I said I'm going to go with the fun on this one the next thing I know we're practically inverted we're in a we're in a beautiful big turning chandelle where we're pulling probably two g's around the corner here and as we get to the top of the thing and just up to the top we're just coming over the top we're absolutely weightless for just a second or two and you just get zero g's there and the guy rolls this thing out and starts putting this aircraft through maneuvers and and I was flabbergasted. I was, I was flabbergasted on the drive home. I didn't have time to be flag, flabbergasted while I was in the aircraft because while I was in the aircraft, I was so flabbergasted I couldn't be flabbergasted. And that's a hell of a word, isn't it, flabbergasted? Uh, so, um, you know, next thing I know, we're, we're pulling two or three G turns, and this guy's doing loops and all this other stuff, and then down on the ground we see this um, construction crew, and this guy goes, ah, they, they really like it when we give them a little show. So he just rolled in there like he's rolling on a target. Next thing I know, we're on the deck at probably 140 knots. It's pretty quick when you're at 50, 60 feet. Um, and we don't make any noise. You can't hear us coming. You can hear a whistle when we go by, and we just... We're zooming past these guys and then came really, uh, really hard on the stick and probably four G's into the pull up, rolled it over and came back and landed. And I was I was done. I was like, OK, this is it. This is this is not exactly what I had in mind, but it's it's good. It's very, very good. Um, and this is available for just about anybody. But there is a step even after that. Um, I got I, I've had the. Uh, I actually cannot believe I'm actually saying this out loud, but it's true. I've actually owned um, two aircraft, and um, one of them is the current one I have, which is a Long Easy, and I still co-own half of uh, a neat little airplane called the Sky Arrow. So um, this one should be a little easier because it's not a movie. Uh, where are you, Sky Arrow? It's a beautiful little airplane. This airplane cost about $60,000. Now, $60,000 is a lot of money. It's not a joke, but it's it's achievable money if you if you work hard and you save and you really decide that this is something you want to do. Sixty thousand dollars, you you can get to sixty thousand dollars, and for sixty thousand um, dollars, the two of us went in on um, this airplane called the Sky Arrow. And why did I like the Sky Arrow? Well, I'll show you as soon as I can find a picture of the damn Sky Arrow. I will show you why I like the Sky Arrow so much. Uh, there we go. Okay, so here's the um, the first airplane that I owned, and I'm going to put this here, and it's going to show up wherever the hell it wants to. Why don't you just go where you're supposed to, you bloody machine? Um, the reason I like the Sky Arrow is is pretty simple, really. I liked it because it didn't look like um, a commercial uh, airliner, uh, uh, rather a general aviation airplane. I finally got my act together here, gang. I know it's taking us forever, so here we go. Let's do some audio visual with this and wrap this up a little more. Uh, dramatically. So the first airplane I ever owned was um, was this one right here, and uh, and I love it. And here it is. Uh, I should probably put the audio on there too. Such sophisticated software we have here. Okay, so here we go. Here's the first airplane I ever owned. It's the um, it's the Sky Arrow, and um, this airplane cost sixty thousand dollars used. Had about hundred and fifty hours on it. But, I mean, you look at this thing. Now, I should tell you right off the bat, um, friend of Stephen Darrow, that this aircraft, although it looks incredibly sleek, and it is incredibly sleek and fun to fly, has got um, on the back there a, a lawnmower engine, I'm pretty sure. And this airplane is, is the slowest airplane in the sky. This airplane's slower than Christmas. You, you, you just cannot 
imagine um, that this thing, you know, this thing's, it, when it's doing 90 knots, 80, 80 knots, 90 knots, it, I don't think I've ever seen it in 90 knots. I've seen it cruising at 80, which is about as fast as somebody who's speeding down the road. It's almost 90 miles an hour somewhere in that general vicinity. But with all of that said, I mean, just look at that thing. I just walked out to that. I saw this airplane in a magazine in 1999 or something like that, somewhere around there. And I saw it and I just said, I, I, I just have to have one of these things. And I watched, I, I kept thinking about it and I kept thinking about it and visualizing it and I never got my, my eye off the ball. Um, and I looked at this thing and I finally just said, Okay, I can do it. I used to go to this. Um, there was a, a restaurant at uh, at Van Nuys. I guess it's still there. It was a terrible restaurant, Ninety uh, Fourth Aero Squadron. Cool idea, terrible food, and um, and I just would sit there when I had no money at all, and I would sit there and, and imagine. All right, one of these days, I'm going to come taxiing past where I am now. I'm going to be on the other side of this chain link fence, and I'm going to taxi past, and I am going to. Um, I'm going to be flying that airplane. And I just never let it go. Uh, and since I didn't let it go, um, it didn't get lost. And eventually in 2005, I guess, maybe 2006, um, I was able to purchase uh, one of these aircraft. And, and I love it. And I put, uh, God, I put something like, six or seven hundred flight hours on this airplane, something like that. That's a lot of flight time, uh, especially when you're going that slow. Uh, but who cares about how slow you're going? Because I was actually, I was actually low to the ground. I was flying fast and I had a stick in, and a stick where the stick should be, I had a throttle where the throttle should be. And you could, you could crank it around a turn. You just do a, you know, heavily banked turn and it's great. And when you're, um, when you're, when you're flying out in the middle of nowhere, like between Los Angeles and Phoenix, for example, there's a lot of desert out there. And, and, and when I was sure, see, because I'm a glider pilot, so I'm, I never go any place. I never take the airplane any place where it cannot make a, a, an emergency landing that both the airplane and I will survive. I just don't go into those. I just don't go there. If, if the terrain is really bad, I go really high. And if, it's, if, it's, if I'm going to go low, then, then it's got to be like immediately landable terrain. So, for example, flying out to Phoenix, um, I'll just put her back up there because it's prettier to look at than I am, certainly. Uh, flying out to, actually, to Tucson several times in this airplane, I would get down to 15 or 20 feet above the deck. Uh, it was a alluvial plane. It was basically hard-packed sand, and this airplane at 40 knots, you can, you can land this airplane in two, 300 feet. Um, I could land this on, an air, on a football field without any trouble whatsoever. Um, <clears throat> And we were just rocking and rolling, and, 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 you know, I'm making jet engine noises in my headphones, and, and that was pretty good. In fact, it was very good. And I, every time I'd walk out to that airplane and, and had it tied down for a while and had it in a hangar for a while, every time I'd look at it, I would just see it, and I'd just go, man, I can't believe it. It's magical. It's like I, I put um, Christmas tree lights in the hangar. You can see over the left there. Um, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. Um, so... What was I doing? Well, I wasn't flying jets for the Air Force. That's absolutely certain. And I wasn't flying uh, through the air at, uh, you know, 450 knots. And I sure as hell wasn't getting shot at. But what was it I wanted from flying for the Air Force? I wanted to fly. I wanted to fly airplanes. I wanted to fly in combat, too. I was, you know, I had a lot of time in flight sims. And luckily for... Um, very luckily for our friend um, uh, Foghorn here, Viper Check, uh, the, the vision um, uh, on my left eye wasn't good enough because if it had been good enough, I would have shot every single one of you bastards down and it would have been easy. Um, so, so you got that. And that, that was really, you know, that was really more than I could ask for. And then I realized that there was something even more than this. Uh, is that what I want? Um, no. That is not what I want. Uh, okay. Uh, well, I'm going to play this even though it's not what I want. Okay, so here we go. So after seven, eight years, because I'm tired of making you guys wait for things. After seven or eight years of, um, of flying the Sky Arrow and having a great time, I decided finally I was coming back. I need to go faster. I was almost doing 30, 40 miles an hour over the ground flying through the um, um, Banning Pass. And I decided I wanted something faster. So um, Stephen, uh, if she's still listening after all of this uh, jaw flapping, uh, show her this. Um.
and away he goes. That is the experience I was looking for. That's the experience I was looking for. I wanted to get into a into a very sleek, fast-looking, pointy-nosed, fighter-looking jet, and I wanted to have a stick, and I wanted to have a throttle, and I wanted to have a canopy, and I didn't want to look at a propeller. So fortunately, Bert Rutan, having um, foreseen all of my needs as a pilot, uh, put the propeller in the back. And if you don't look at it, you don't have to pretend, you can pretend it's not there. That aircraft costs more than $60,000, but not much more. In fact, actually, come to think of it, that airplane costs less than, than the Sky Arrow did because it's experimental. You can get into a long easy for probably about a, a good one, you know, one that won't, won't hurt you, probably $25,000, maybe thirty, something like that for a decent one. Um, and and you know, that's, that's a car. Um, and if you decide to do that, you will find yourself flying the kind of things you would want to be flying for the Air Force, but it's yours, and you get to fly it whenever you want to, and you get to fly it wherever you want to. And you're not, um, you're not under um, you know, strict orders, your, your waypoints, missions, and so on. You can just go out and fool around, and it's just really, really fun. And I'm sorry, I, I, if, I think $20,000, $30,000 is within the means of any American who's determined to save that much money over time. Now, it doesn't have quite the roll rate that the F-16 has, um, but it looks fast and it feels fast. And I go over the ground at 200 miles an hour. Uh, the places that used to take me five hours to drive to, I can now get there in just over an hour. And it's cool. Now, finally, if you're, about to, if you're feeling better, hopefully you are feeling better, uh, there's something that might make you feel even better. Uh, I just grab the first one I can, and uh, this is... I realized I hadn't set up the audio for that. Let me set up the audio so I can talk over this. Uh, that is an L39, and that should do it. Let's put her back again and see what she got here. Okay, so this is um, a Czechoslovakian uh, trainer. Uh, this is, it's a Russian trainer, but most of them were built in Czechoslovakia. Uh, and this is basically the equivalent of um, kind of a mix between the Tweety Bird and the, um, and the T-38 Talon. It's... Uh, it's probably a 350 knot um, aircraft, 400 knots on, you know, if you get up high. Now, I've ridden in the back seat of those, that aircraft, not that exact aircraft, but one virtually identical to it. And when the canopy comes down on that baby and you feel the air conditioning kick in and the pressurization kick in, you go, oh, okay. And then that jet engine sound starts and, and, and you taxi out and the suspension the, is just very rock solid. Trainers need really good landing gear because students slam them down. The L-39 costs, depending on how nice a one you want, a real nice one is probably $250,000 maybe, something like that. I'm going to say it's in that general neighborhood, um, and I'll do another one for you just because it's so cool. And I know several people that own one of these, and I could own one, and I expect to someday, although there may be other choices I like better. So now we're talking about... Um, a fair amount of money, but uh, let me see here. Yeah, come on. Yes. Okay, so here's another picture, and this might as well have been me. Um, that's an L-39 um, over the Mojave Desert. It looks like the Mojave Desert to me anyway, and um, if that's not close enough for you, then then I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> that's That's life. Right, that's as close as you're going to get. But look at that thing. I mean, you—that you, is within range. That is—that's not even a house. It's a in Los Angeles. It's not even a down payment on on some houses out here. It's some of them you can get for you know, I don't know. It's, I've seen them for hundred thousand dollars, and again, that's not cheap. And they're much more expensive to maintain and fly. This thing is a gas hog. This is a kind of airplane where you can watch and just look at the fuel gauge and watch it go down in real time. Just watch this, this thing on mine. But we have taken that thing down on the deck, and I've done 300 knots uh, at 50 feet. And if that's, not, um, if that's not what you're looking for, then I don't know what you're looking for. Because I'm here to tell you, friend of Steve Darrow, that when you're in the backseat of that, and after I'm, I'm within probably 20 hours of 1,000 of flight hours, 
if you don't think that is uh, flying as close to the fighter uh, world as you can, that's that's pretty good. I've seen uh, footage of uh, who was it? Might have been maybe it was Portugal or somebody. And they were doing training, um, and there was an, uh, two F-16s and an L-39. The L-39 is not a match for the F-16, and if you watch the L-39s do an uh, air show, uh, Breitling does a terrific air show with L-39s. They're impressive, and they're fast, but they're not, they're not like the F-16. The F-16 comes by, and, and just just stunning. But there you go, right? So you, don't, you can't always get what you want, and, um, but if you try sometimes, you get what you need. Uh, and that's basically it. Um, it. You can get closer than you think right now, and you can probably do it faster than you think. So my final advice to you would be simply this. Understand what it is you want from that um, pilot flight training experience. What did you want? It took me a long time. It took me 20 years to figure out what I wanted. And what I wanted was I wanted to fly in an airplane that, that performed and felt like a fighter. I wanted a canopy and I wanted a stick and I wanted and I want to look at a propeller and, and all of it. So I found gliders. Then I found the Sky Air. Then I found um, the Long Easy. Then I found the L-39. Um, and as I get older and older and wiser and wiser, these things become um, more within reach. The ultimate airplane for me is a Viper jet. Yes, I'm going to go look, since you asked. Um, because to me, and I think probably pilots, most pilots can uh, connect to what I'm going to say here. Um, I think most pilots, no matter how much money you have or don't have or whatever, have a sense of what is the end airplane. What is it? What is the end airplane? Um, the end airplane simply means... Uh, the aircraft at which point you are as happy as you possibly can be and there's nothing going to catch up to that. That's it. Uh, and for me, it's uh, this um, Viper jet, which I think is still downloading. Hey, baby. How are you? Here you go. Um, here we go. So uh, this is also available for sale, um, believe it or not. And hang on, yeah, I wasn't as prepared for this as I should be, but nevertheless. Now, you want to really have a heart attack and something cool, take a look at this. This will blow your mind. Um, that's the Viper Jet, and it is brand new carbon fiber airplane, and that baby performs. Really, really does perform. And it looks like a million bucks. And it looks like a million bucks, but it only costs half a million bucks, maybe a little less. They didn't make a lot of them. Uh, they're, they're kit built and, um, not many of them are finished, but good Lord, that is a beautiful airplane. And that could be you in the front seat of that. I know you feel like it isn't, and it can't be that you missed your chance, but it's not true. Just because you didn't get trained by the Air Force doesn't mean you can't fly one of these. You can. You can fly one of these where you want to and when you want to. It's, it's a long road, and a lot of that road has got to do with money, and money is key to so many things in life. But you can get there, and, and you can do... I'm sure somewhere you can do what I did, which was when I started flying, I was, I just, I was making $50 a day. Uh, but I was making $50 a day working at the glider port. And in exchange for um, working for $50 a day, raking rocks out in the desert, they let me have a couple of flight hours um, a week. And it was worth it. So... Um, if anybody understands this disappointment, I do. And that's why I've spent almost 45 minutes on this subject. But, again, isolate what it is you wanted and then get as close to it as you can. You, you, won't, you may not get exactly where you want to be, although I figure, you know, maybe right now you can buy a MiG-21. If somebody owns a MiG-29, that's a, used to be in the 90s, that was a frontline fighter, still a frontline fighter. Uh, someday maybe they'll do something with the F-16s and you can pick one up for a low, low 600 grand or something somewhere. But in any event, you can get very close and I, and I wish you the very best and, and just go take a ride in either a sailplane or see if you can find a, a, an experimental long easy or something or just go for, you know, if you if you got a little bit of money, take a um, one of these scenic rides in the back of an L-39. It'll really put the hook into you and then you'll realize, okay, this now I have to figure out how to get there. But there's a place to go. That's the main thing. Um, okay, I'm going to have to cut these way down on account of the fact that uh, my, my beautiful fiancé is here and we have a dinner date, so I'm going to do um, one more. I told her I'd be out of here by 7. Uh, I'll, do, I'll do two more. Uh, this one's very simple. It's, it's Steve Darrow again, and he's basically saying the foot of the Gorn behind me there 
on the wall behind you appears to be loose. That would be right. Uh, it's hard with this. That would be right there. Does he run around the office when you're away and doesn't get fully back in place when you show up, or is he just making his break very slowly? Clever question, Stephen, and, um, and, and well asked. But the truth is, uh, no, he gets taken down and put up every day because, as you probably know by now, uh, I begin my day the same way every time. I, I, I'm up at 4.30. I take a, a shower in ice-cold running stream water. And then I come into the office, do an hour and a half of calisthenics and yoga. And then every day before I go and do my serious work, I uh, put on uh, that right there. I put that on. And then I um, take the Gordon Captain, who's on the back of the wall back there, and, uh, and, I, and, I, and I wrestle with him. Uh, and while I do that, I have music that goes... Uh, Dun 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 and and it somehow for some reason or another makes my day. Um okay, so here's the final question we can take this is a good question, it won't take too long, I think. There's another bingo point for you. Um Merlin Wendelbow. The amazing Merlin Wendelbow has a question, and it is a good question. What actually is fascism? I hear this term thrown around quite freely, and it seems to mean, from context and usage, to mean everything from a heavy-handed authoritarian to you disagree with me, especially you got the last one right. But what is it really? So I can intelligently humiliate any liberal who uses the term incorrectly. And good news for you, uh, Steve. I'm sorry, Merlin. Good news for you. Um, the term fascist is actually the kind of term that humiliates left-wingers. Uh, the more you know about it, the more humiliating it gets for them. So the actual word fascism comes from um, the Mussolini's uh, party in Italy, which came to power in the mid-20s, I want to say. It was well before Hitler in, in Germany. And, and the word fascism comes from the Italian word fascisti, and it basically means a bundle of sticks. This goes back to Roman times. The, the um, uh, Mussolini's fascist party took the name Fascisi, which means a bundle of sticks, and they named it after, after that. So why a bundle of sticks? Well, the idea was, and you can, if you look at the logos of these people, you can see this, as I say, in ancient, um, in ancient uh, Rome. And as a matter of fact, I am virtually positive that there is a... a, a a, a bundle of sticks of classical fascisti on the on Abraham Lincoln's chair in the Lincoln Monument. I saw it. I saw it just a couple weeks ago. In any event, fascisti. And um, so, why would you name a movement after a bundle of sticks? Why would you do that? Well, the whole idea of of a fascisti is that. It, an individual stick you can break, and if you had a bunch of sticks, you could break them all one by one, break them, break them, break them. But if you bundle them together, you can't break them. They're they're unbreakable. And the reason that the um, that the Italians uh, authoritarian big state dictatorship picked it was because, like all giant socialist states, it's about the state. It wanted something big. And what it was basically saying by calling itself fascism was it was saying individually we're weak, but together we're strong. Together, absolutely unified under a single leader, bound together, um, we will go from being breakable sticks into fascisti. And, um, and uh, there it is. So basically, the word fascism comes from a political philosophy that is collectivism. Um, and, you know, we, we've talked about this before. That's probably another bingo thing, and if it isn't, it should be. You, you look at conservative, uh, Republican, Democrat, liberal, all these terms, it all breaks down basically into, into two schools of thought. Are you an individualist or are you a collectivist? And virtually all of history is collectivism. The United States, a rare example, in fact, maybe the only example, um, the first example, certainly, of, of a society set up for the basis of individuals. So uh, your leftist friends are collectivists, and you can tell they're collectivists because they want things like socialized health care, and they want a bigger government, and they want more taxes, and they want more government programs. They are collectivists. And the term that collectivists used for themselves was to take a bundle of sticks, each of us together are stronger than we are individually, forget the fact that you're an individual person, join the giant state collective, and we will name this this party after this bundle of sticks, which is called a fasci, and you are now a fascist. 
So, next time some liberal D-bag decides to call you a, a fascist and, and, and make it into you being all about violence and coercion, because that's what it is, just gently remind them that the word comes from the, um, the Latin word for a bundle of sticks. A bundle of sticks means a collective of people. It meant not individuality. It meant everybody functioning for the state. And at the top of the state was the dictator, and the, and the, the, the lines of authoritarianism went all the way down to the ground. That's all it is. It's just a, a name for dictatorship and tyranny, and it was picked because the rubes out there thought it sounded good. Uh, same way the rubes out there think all this stuff sounds good. Uh, Hitler saw Mussolini come to power, and, and Hitler was waiting in the wings, basically, and, and he said, boy, this is something. So he started the Nazi party. Here's another fun thing that you can add to uh, your, your destruction of somebody who calls you a fascist. You can say, not only am I not a fascist because I'm an individualist. You're the collectivist. You're the fascist. Fascism means collectivism. I'm the individualist. You're the, you're the fascist. And I'm also, since I'm an individualist, you're a Nazi, too. You're a fascist and you're a Nazi. And I'm neither of those things. The Nazis came to power, and they, and they deeply admired the fascist um, system of, of Mussolini, and they adopted it. And when you say fascist today, you usually mean uh, a Nazi. Uh, all the Russians who were fighting in World War II were talking about fighting. They didn't say fighting the Germans. They said, we're going to fight fascism. We're going to throw out the fascists. Um, and so uh, what fascism is operationally is an, a very powerful state. It does not own private businesses or private property in the way that communism does, but it directs them. The state directs the economy. It's the state tells businesses what to do. And then within very narrow confines, the businesses can go ahead and do that. But it's not capitalism under any circumstances. And it's certainly not freedom because the entire idea of these giant socialist states was that the, was that the collective was more important than the individual. And you had three of them going on at the same time. You had, you had Mussolini, in Italy with his bundles of sticks, his fasci being fascist. You had Hitler, who, um, whose fascism was called National Socialism. Nazis, uh, an acronym for National Socialist German Workers Party. It's uh, National Socialist NSDAP, National Socialist Deutschland Aberte Partei, something like that. But it's Nazi is, is a term, it's a contraction for National Socialists. And every time the Nazis would talk about themselves, they would call themselves national socialists. We believe in a national socialist future and our national socialist identity and blah, 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 socialists. OK. And then, of course, on the other side of the of the of the border, you have something that's very similar. And, and that is communism, which does own the property. But like fascism and Nazism, communism is about the state, that the state has all the power. It's got gigantic police forces, and anybody who decides to speak out against the state is taken out and killed. That's true in, in fascist Italy. It's true in Nazi Germany. It's true in communist uh, uh, Russia, and communist China, too, for that matter. So they're all about socialism. They're all about a collective. They're all about the philosophy that the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few, and if you're an individual who disagrees with that, then you're just simply taken away and either shot or worked to death, depending on how uh, kindly the particular, you know, s drunken sergeant that pulls you off the street feels. So, um, fascists are collectivists. Conservatives are individualists. And if you ask me which is more important, the individual or the collective, I would say the individual is more important. And that's why the Constitution is written the way it is. The Constitution doesn't protect groups of people because if some people are protected, other people are not. And those people usually end up being the scapegoats. And the next thing you know, your rivers run red with blood. The Constitution protects me individually. And as long as the Constitution protects individuals, then everybody's protected because everybody's an individual. Um, so you believe in, in, in your own... Um, destiny. You think that if you work hard, you should keep virtually all of your money. I think that too. We're individualists. You think you're responsible for your own health care. I think that too. That's part of being an adult and part of being a grown up. I don't have to have somebody tie my shoelaces. I don't have to have somebody cut my steak into little pieces. And I can also do things like buy my own health care. And they are the collectivists, which means that they are brothers, cousins to the fascists, the um, Italian socialists, the Nazis, the racial socialists, or the communists which were the class socialists. But that's basically what they are. They're three different versions of the same foul-smelling brew. Uh, conservatives are none of these things. And 
and we don't believe in any of these things. And that's why it's so hilarious to hear these left-wingers talking about um, the rise of fascism, and they, and they beat people up as they wear their black uh, clothes and their black masks and their black hoodies. They beat people up and say, that's for you, you stinking fascist. And the irony of it is not even irony anymore. It goes past irony now. It's just, it's tragedy is what it is. It's just, it's just unbelievable tragedy. So um, hopefully that helps you there, Merlin. Um, you can look up uh, the words and you can see the bundle of sticks, the Italian logo on the wings of their airplanes, for instance, is a very stylized um, fascisi, and uh, I may have the pronunciation of that wrong. I just want to see something. I said something, and I suspect it's true. Let me double check it. Um, let me look at the Lincoln Memorial because I don't think I saw it there on the feet of on the bottom of the chair. Now you have to understand. Well, what? What are you saying? Lincoln was a fascist? No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that Abraham Lincoln died 70 years before. Um, before fascism came into power. Hey, look at that. Yep, there you go. What about that? Here you go, folks. I'll bring this up for you. Um, if you look carefully, and you don't have to look that carefully, it's about as clear as it can be here. Hang on a second. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, feast, you know, feast your ever-loving eyes on this. Uh, here it comes. It's coming through now, Come. So there's Abraham Lincoln, and Abraham Lincoln sits in his uh, throne of glory looking out at the miscreants out there in, in the Capitol and uh, in, in the Congress. But look at the way that his, um, his seat is constructed. You can see that the front legs of that, of that chair are fasci, fascisi, rather. They're bundles of sticks. And I'm sure that at the time that the Lincoln Memorial was, um, was carved, it was, it was put there to um, to show that we're united, and and lots of cool things happened before the before the World War II happened, and, and you know screwed up everything. This was a symbol of unity, not a symbol of conformity. It was a symbol of of, of e pluribus unum. And uh, somebody just beat me to it in the in the um, comments stream. Uh, T dog Lyles, I think. Uh, not just not just this idea of unity um, and strength through unity that was was perverted by the Italians and turned into conformity and and the abandonment of individuality, but likewise the swastika was a was a um, was a ancient very ancient symbol, and it often meant uh, health and good luck. Um, and then the Nazis got a hold of it, and what they did under that banner has branded the swastika for the rest of time appropriately, in my opinion. Um, so, uh, there you go. That's another thing that they like. They like, um, you, you look at these Antifa people, I've seen some of these Antifa websites, and their colors are red and black. Red and white and black. These are the colors of Nazi Germany. Uh, bright red. Um, the communists, when Hitler came to power, the communists had their red flags, and Hitler said, we need something that dynamic, and instead of going with blue, he basically said, no, red is the color we want, and they basically stole their flag from him. Hitler personally designed the, the Nazi flag, um, and some bad things happened after that. So there you go. And by the way, to just to, if you really want to stick it to them as they're, you know, if you want to give them a parting shot as they, as they slink back to their, um, to their cubicle, you know, with tears in their eyes, just throw this at them too. Um, both the fascists and the Nazis and the communists came to power they didn't come to power saying, if, if you uh, elect us, uh, we're going to execute all of you, and we're going to leave our cities in ruins, and we're going to get into wars that is going to cost you uh, all of your male loved ones and most of your family and all the rest of it. They didn't do that. They all came to power by saying, we're not bad guys, we're not capitalists, we're not heartless people, we're socialists. They came offering socialism and free health care and job programs. Not jobs, job programs. And so... Um, the Germans didn't vote for Nazism as we know Nazism looking backwards. They voted for a guy who said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have the government make some jobs for us and we'll build some Autobahns and, and we'll have health care and we'll have uh, all these other things. And they said, and we'll destroy the unions and we'll do all this other stuff. And they said, sign me up. So not only are you not a fascist or a Nazi or a socialist or a collectivist, you are in fact 
one of the few people wide enough to wake to realize that um, that this is how they always sell it. So when they try to sell it here, that's why people like me run around with their hair on fire. Not that I have a problem with what socialists say, although I do have a problem with what they say. It's what it evolves into. When you have an all-powerful state, then that power gets concentrated, and the more concentrated it is, the more it tends to corrupt people. Um, so there you go. That's pretty much it. And I'm afraid this is going to be maybe might be the this might be the shortest uh, stratosphere lounge in history. Somebody, the keeper of the records, will know that it's a 148, by the way. Uh, and 148 turned out to be a little less than an hour long. And I've got a dinner date I have to go to, and, and there she sits waiting patiently. And uh, I don't know, she's. I think she's. I think she's drawing a knife of some kind. I, I better get going. It's looking bad. Um, we will uh, see you all in two weeks. Next week we'll be in Dallas. So um, there we go. Uh, sorry for the short show, but I thought it'd be better than nothing. I hate to miss uh, two weeks in a row, and so we didn't have to. Um, hang in there. We'll be seeing you live uh, during the rest of the week. We'll be doing the NRA stuff from next week. I think we're going to do uh, um, right angle with Scott in Dallas. We'll figure it out. Those of you in the Texas area, I will post it. I promise I will. Um, and we'll all go out and have a beer and, and drink to freedom in, in Texas. That's something you know that you can actually still be proud of. Okay, that'll do it for 148. Thanks for joining us. Thanks especially to the members that make this possible. Um, and until next time, Strata Loungers, your, um, your mugs are on the way, and I hope you enjoy them as much as we did, and we will see you next time.